The Marshall Podcast. How's it going? Welcome to episode two of the Marshall Podcast. My name is Daniel P. Carter and I'm going to be the host of this thing. So on the first episode I had Slash as my guest and obviously he's a legend and a lot of people were like, how are you going to top that? Well friends, I decided that what we should do is double up on the guests and give you two awesome people for the price of one. So the guests on this one are Corey Taylor of Slipknot and Stone Sour and the wonderful Lizzie Hale of Hailstorm. Firstly, when Corey was in the UK for dates in support of the latest Stone Sour album, Hydrograd, I caught up with him to discuss the album, some touring, creativity and life in general. And we discussed not only the world according to Corey when his head was in Stone Sour, but also the writing that was happening in the Slipknot camp at the time for the album that was to become We Are Not Your Kind, which is obviously one of the metal albums of 2019. So that was happening while he was busy touring and we spoke a little bit about that. And it should be pointed out that not only is Corey an incredible frontman, songwriter, author, actor, radio host and raconteur, he's also a wicked guitar player. So when I asked him about why he uses Marshall, he went into full fanboy mode, which is beautiful to hear. After that conversation, you're going to be hearing me chatting with Lizzie Hale, talking about her early influences and inspirations that led her to become one of the most celebrated front women in modern rock. But as I said, first up, Mr. Corey Taylor. Okay, so you're, you're over here at the moment. You're doing Stone Sour. Hydrograds is, is totally... It seems to me, like, from an outside perspective, I mean, this is obviously the biggest and the longest you've been out, out with, with Stone Sour, and yeah. it, it looks like everything's going super well. It is probably our most successful couple of years, man, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, we've, it's, I, it's, I mean, it's, it's very gratifying, you know, cause you put, you put, you know how it is, you put a lot of work in and you know how good the music is, but that's never, it's not necessarily how it's going to transcribe for the fans or to the audience, you know, and this, this time just lined up perfectly, you know, like, people understood like, at first some of the heavier fans were like what is this and it's like it can't always be that crush 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 it's got to have some heart and our heart right now is in this more hard rock rock and roll vibe you know yeah. like we've always been a band that straddles all those different genres and we wanted to find a way to bring some positivity into it you know and, and really make it something all-encompassing, you know, put the attitude back into it, you know, because for me, that's what active rock has definitely been missing, you know. Yeah. So to have that really be embraced by the audience, you know, a around the world, you know, I mean, these the shows we've done over here have been the biggest we've ever had. And that's I think that's because of the culmination of all those years of work, the fact that the songs and the music are great and the connection bef between all five of us. Yeah. And you can feel that on the album too. And that's what's key, you know, and it's nothing against anyone who was in this band before. It just, there's something special about this five, you know, these five guys, man. And you can feel that on stage. And that's why I think that's why the shows are blowing up. And that's just been so awesome. And we've been, you know, every night we go out and it's a sold out show. We just cheese like idiots because it's just like, are we getting to do this? It's like Dave Murray every night. You know, yeah. Dave, that Dave Murray grin every <laughs> night. He's just like, you know, doing it for 40 years. He still goes out. He's like, this is awesome. You know, it's the yeah. best. It's that pure, unadulterated joy, you know? Yeah. You can tell that. I I mean, you know, we've discussed when, when you were making the record and stuff already. And, but I think the liveliness of that album and uh, the boldness was some of the yeah. some of the things that you did with it, and yeah. I, I think it's it um it was very honest, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's connected. I think it also is because it's I mean it, it kicks ass. Yeah, yeah. So there's that, but I think there's the honesty to it as well. Like last time I saw you play was in uh, was it well it was in London. Yeah, and um and it was it, like the crowd was it, it was a different crowd than I was expecting as well. Yeah. It was like it, it's it's so fully formed and they're so all invested in it. Yeah, yeah. It was awesome to see, man. Yeah, I mean, it was. It's it's definitely. It, it's not your typical London crowd. 
hmm. you know, which can be very judgy, you know, which, yeah. you know, it's a very, very LA, New York, London kind of vibe yeah. get, where you get a lot of crossed arms and, like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be the judge of how good you are, you know, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is fine. But I've, I've never been scared of that. I've never been scared of those audiences. You just bulldoze through, you know, it's, it's like, <laughs> it's the bands that are scared of it that try to avoid playing those cities because hmm. it's, 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 you know, it's easy to be, it's easy to be exceptional in an elevator. Try being exceptional in a room full of people, you know, yeah. that's when you know you're good. You know, it's the same mentality I've had with Slipknot as it is with Stone Sour. Is that if you're going to be, if you're going to rise above everyone, then you need to go out and rise above everyone. Yeah. So we set that, you know, we set that precedent early on with everything. So we just come out and, and it's infectious. You know, yeah, I think that's you, what it is because yeah. you're, you're not a stare at your shoes and kick your pedal board kind Absolutely of guy. Absolutely not. No, there's no <laughs> pretense in us at all. I mean, yeah. we're just like, we're just, screw all that shit, you know? Hmm. Let's just be ourselves. And people are going to embrace that. And it's nothing against bands that do that because if that's your thing, that's how you feel it, by all means, go ahead and do it. Yeah. I have never been able to do that. Even if it's a slow song, I'm all over the place, you know, like I'm feeling it. So for me, people see that. And they get caught up in it. And then suddenly, it doesn't matter what city it is. It's not about the city. It's about the band and the audience and that connection. And after that, it's just, you know, there are no boundaries. There are no borders. Yeah, I agree. Once you have that connection, it's, you know, I found it myself back in the day. You'd be touring and, and it would be like, where are we today? Yep. And you, you're in a different city. You're on the other side of the world. It could be Tokyo. It could be London. Yep. Or it could be Duluth. Yeah. But once that connection's made, it, it makes no difference. And it's and it and it makes touring easier, you yeah. know, because now th- that 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 doubt is gone. Now it's about and just enjoying the moment. Everybody's gonna have rough gigs, mm-hmm. you know, but when you know that you have a connection with that audience, then then it doesn't matter, you know, like the the, the missteps and the miscues and all the weirdness. It just becomes laughable. Yeah. You know, it's when you walk on stage, you're not sure of where that connection is. That's when the problem starts. Yeah. Are you one of those people that beats yourself up if you have a, like a, sh- this is the thing I always found. It was like, um, you know, in, in, in bands myself. And then when I, you know, I speak to a fair few bands, mm. <laughs> but yeah, it would be, just a few, yeah. yeah, but it would be that, um, you know, if somebody has a bad gig, I, I, you know, they'll come off stage and I'll be like, that was awesome. And they'd be like, oh yeah, but I, uh, you know, I did this one yeah. little tiny thing and it's been beating me up the whole show and it yeah. just plays in your head and it plays in your head. And it's like, no one saw that, man. I yeah. am the worst. I'm, Are you? I am my worst critic. Yeah. If I have a bad show, I try really hard not to wear it on my face. Yeah. But I, but I, I can, I, yeah, it's, it's tough. And I, I try and I, and I don't blame anybody else, you know. Mm. Technical difficulties. I sometimes I can be really hard on our on our crew um, because it's it's little stuff that can that happens yeah. several times, and I'm just like, God, we talked about this, <laughs> but I will not scream. I will not freak out. I let myself settle down, and mm. then I discuss it. So, but when I'm Would on you stage, used to have been that guy though. Ah, you know, I yeah. I think I. <laughs> I think back in the day I would have been, you yeah. know, and there's definitely times where I'm on stage and I'm so in it that I'm s- just screaming, but I'm not screaming at people. I'm just screaming, yeah. you know, um, but that's the passion, yeah. you know, that's the passion. It's not about, I'm not attacking anybody in particular. Yeah. I'm just like, you know, when you care as much as I do, you want every show to be perfect, Yeah, you know, and whether it's perfect in the imperfection or in the in whatever you just want that show to go off without a hitch and it's it's tough sometimes man yeah. you know so you're saying that, that this is going super well mm. and but it's what is it drawing to a close on this tour well it's, it feels it's, like it's been it's been a minute right it's yeah we started yeah it's been over by the end of this tour it'll be over a year that we've been on the road wow. so uh yeah um and then we're touring into November, yeah. so because uh, we're doing the Aussie run, which yeah. is killer, you know, that's direct incredible. to Aussie. Yeah, that's that's a hell of a badge of honor for us, man. Yeah. And they and they picked us. 
That rules. So I'm just like, oh, like we just got knighted. You know, it's so yeah. killer. It's um, funny you saying about about wanting everything to be perfect and having those kind of jitters about things because, like, I was speaking to him at the weekend at Download. You know, there's a guy that's that's been doing this longer than most of his fan base has been alive. Yeah. And and he just he was just like, I'm kind of nervous. It's, it's Download. You know, I'm yeah. at Donington. Yeah. And and I think that's really beautiful. And he was like, you know, I, I guess it means I care. Yeah. And right? I was like, right. <laughs> It's when you stop caring that you should stop, period. Yeah. You know? Because you're not doing it for the same reasons yeah. that you started doing in the first place. I, I talk to I talk to fans all the time and they're like, you know, what what's your motivation for doing this? And it's the same since I'm thirteen. It's because I love doing this. I love doing music. I love making music and creating yeah. it. it. The money's gonna come and go. Mm. I if I wanted to make money. There's a host of different jobs that I could do mm. just to make money. This isn't about that. There's yeah. something deeper. I'm glad I get to make money doing this. Yeah, for sure. But it's not about that for me. It's about the next one. Have Have there been those moments, though, where you've lost sight of that a bit? Only when I was drinking. Yeah. Um, and that's only because... And it wasn't because of the music. Like I was still committed to the music, but... I was so out of it that yeah. um, that it, it took me out of myself. So I, I can't even in- include that because it wasn't me mm. at the time, you know. Yeah. Um, but I also I also know that one of the things that I realized and what it actually encouraged me down the road of of uh, sobriety was seeing how bad my uh, my voice was sounding how bad my uh creative level was at hmm. that was a huge piece in me kind of you know you know calling it a day on that shit it's it's a funny one isn't it because there's almost this romantic as, as we were saying before we started recording there's this uh, almost romanticism about about being that that artist that, yeah. that lives that world mm-hmm. you know and there's so few examples of people that have that have managed to to be creative and and carry themselves through that and yet it just seems to be this myth that's 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 embedded in the very like heart of rock and roll yeah it's i think it's encouraged by the people who are actually embedded in that yeah you know they they want people to think that it's hard to create without chemicals Hmm. you know and that's some that's some addict language yeah because i used to do that for me from a performing standpoint i used i was convinced that i couldn't perform if i didn't have a jack and coke Hmm. at least one and then that became two and then that became half a bottle you know, hmm. that's a that's a addic- that's addiction, you know. Hmm. So I think that's a, a myth per- or perpetuated by addicts who are looking for people to reinforce their dependency, you know. And it's easy. I mean, especially when you see the antics and hear the oh, it's such a great time. And there were great times. Yeah, for sure. You know. However, that had nothing to do with making an album. That had nothing to do with writing and performing and and you know using your ability. That was the that was the after effect. You know that was the yeah. after party. I have only been loaded in the studio twice. You know, and I didn't like it one bit. I was because I couldn't control anything. Yeah, you know. And and then listening back to shit, I was like, oh, this is horrible. You know, I just, I, why did I do that? Hmm. You know? So I've really tried to to kind of kill that myth for people. It's like, it's like if, you, if that's what you think, then, I mean, God bless you. That's fine. If that's what works for you, that's what works for you. I'm not going to convince you otherwise. However, it is not the law of the land. Yeah. You don't have to be loaded to fucking create. You don't have to be loaded to fucking have a good time. You know, I mm. actually think you sound better and play better, and you 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 just you have a better energy when you're not. You know, yeah. Because then the focus is on you. It's you. Do, you there are no uh, there are no excuses after that. 
It's you. And that's the rawness of what we do. Yeah, I hear that. I mean, we say this all the time, but yeah. you're in a very um, unique position mm. in the sense that you're a front man to, to these two enormous bands. And, um, and, you, and you, you manage to work the balance between those. And so you're finishing up the cycle of this. And whilst that's happening, the other guys are, are writing yeah. for, for the next Slipknot record. Yeah. And how are you feeling about that? It's, it's killer. Yeah. It's, oh my God, it's so good. Yeah. I mean, it's, and this is like, we're, uh, we're talking a lot, man, which mm. is great, you know, um, for whatever reason. Yeah. The communication is really good right now with Slipknot, which is great, you know. Mm. We just have never been the best at talking to each other, you know. We were just ferocious people that just loved to destroy and create together, you know. And now, and maybe it's because, you know, we're kind of getting up there and whatnot, and we've been doing this long enough that maybe we're allowing ourselves to trust each other, you know? Yeah. Because I know that was one of the biggest things is, like, it, the, the guys were worried how I would feel about them getting together and writing stuff and doing writing sessions without me. And in the past, I probably would have been hurt, you know, from an ego standpoint. But... The thing that I realize is that I know whatever they give me is going to be fucking amazing, yeah. you know? And it's, you know, nine times out of ten, I don't write the lyrics until that music is done anyway. Yeah, because exactly. it's a reaction to And it, I right? don't need to be there to fucking, you know, help arrange or whatever. If, if I have arrangement ideas, they listen, which yeah. is very cool. So I kind of, I understand their hesitation. And I have done whatever I can to go, hey, go and do it. Don't worry about me, you know? I I think it's great. I love the initiative. I love the fact that you guys are chomping at the bit to create. Oh, fucking go do it, you know? Yeah. And that encouragement, I think, has been phenomenal. Not just between me and, like, all the guys, but me and Clown, man. Fucking we talk, at like, every week. We talk at least three or four times a week, which is killer, you know? Yeah. And we're really, we're rebuilding a rapport that I think maybe had been missing for a while, you know, because of our lives, because of the shit. Just we're both, you know, we both have families. We both are, you know, doing other things. Yeah. It's, it's been good to reconnect, man. And that re reconnection has led to all the other, all these other people in the band reconnecting and shit. And it's, it's been cool. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? I think that that's what makes a, a creative unit thrive in the sense that if you can live outside of that unit yeah. and, and make other things it's only going to make you appreciate that that so much more right yeah yeah and i think i think when we were younger we couldn't we couldn't understand that yeah you know like we had such a gang mentality with slipknot that anything outside of that seemed foreign seemed like it's like unacceptable you know mm. and you know, I was one of the first to step out of it, so I really kind of took the brunt of that, and and I, I took it a little too personally, maybe in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. Um, now I think the guys understand why I did it is because I just at the time I just there was no way I was going to be able to write like those guys do. I just don't, you know. Yeah. The, the stuff that I write is completely different. I've gotten better over the years, and I've 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 come to trust myself and offer them songs and riffs that i write and shit but you know i was i'm this just they're fucking light years ahead of me from a skill set you know and and i and i readily admit that but i had to be able to do stone sour to have that to be able to go back to yeah. them and go like here's this confidence now and i think we we all kind of appreciate that now something that comes it's only going to come over time isn't it yeah yeah i think i'm growing as people and and being I don't mean when I say mature as artists. I don't mean that it, that to imply that you were immature before. No, but no, I, I, I totally. Do you know understand. what I'm saying? I, I, I just think yeah. I just think that that's something that comes where you suddenly go, okay, I get it now. Yeah, and it's and that comfort, that maturity allows you to appreciate the other side of it and really yeah. listen to it with different ears, you know. And it's it's such a kind of coming into the light kind of feeling that you're mm. just like, oh. God, 
so glad we're here now, you know? Yeah. And I feel that with all the guys. I think I think losing Paul really really kind of set us on this path towards that. Cuz we realized, we kind of woke up one day and realized it's like god, we are really taking all of this for granted in a lot of ways, you know? And because of that, that really that re, that made us all reassess, you know, our priorities, um, our relationships, and you know, kind of came to the understanding. It's like, man, we could lose each other, like that. Yeah. Let's let's stop fucking about, you know. Hmm. That's an interesting one. When I, when I was doing one of these um, with Lizzie from Hailstorm the other day and, and we started talking about the, the martial side of things, I think it's interesting because something that we we both were saying was that, you know, I, I wanted to know how how somebody got into playing music and who their idols were and, and how those people influenced what they wanted to do. But And it, I think something like um, Marshall is that it's, it's one of those things that feels like uh, it's, it's an iconic thing. It's it's like great, yeah. It's it's an amazing piece of equipment, and yeah. it can make you sound like this person, this person, and you can find your own sound within that. But one of the key things that never really gets spoken about is that you know we were saying about these things that are ingrained within rock and roll. It just feels like it's one of those things. Yeah, yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you think of amps, if you don't immediately think of Marshall, then you have a very two-dimensional view of what is of what music can be capable of. Let's mm. put it that way, because the martial amps are so versatile and so manipulative, you know. And there are so many different types of heads and four twelve and stacks and mm. so many different configurations that you can come up with to to really find a sound. Yeah. Because that's the key to everything, yeah, isn't it? Exactly. It's finding your sound, and mm -hmm. that's why that's why a band becomes a successful band rather than just a clone. And the beautiful thing is that Marshalls, they, God, how do I say it? Marshalls intensify what you're using. Yeah. Most amps sound the way they sound, regardless of what goes through it. You know. Hmm. Uh, and it's nothing against those amps. I'm, the reason certain people use those amps is because they want that reliability. A Marshall amp takes more creativity. It yeah. takes more vision. Uh, it takes trial and error to find your sound. That's why the greats have used them. Is because yeah. they. It's. It's not. It's not just the paint brush. It's the paint as well. Hmm. It's the canvas, all of that going together. A Fender through a Marshall sounds completely different than a Gibson through a Marshall or a Novo through a Marshall hmm. or a, you know, a PRS through a Marshall. That is how versatile a Marshall is. Yeah. Whereas other amps, you can, you know, it's, it's pretty much a straight line, you know. Whether it's solid state or tube, it's completely different. And that's why Marshalls are the absolute go-to. When it comes to, all right, I don't want to just play music. I want to make my music. So I need to figure out what that sounds like, you know? Yeah. For me, it's always been, I'm meat and potatoes. I want, <laughs> I want the razor blade version of what a guitar sounds like, you know? I want it. I, it's like I want a, a nice, warm, glassy, clean tone. And I also want the sound of fury when it comes to, yeah. you know, a, you know, I want the I want the dumpster fire of dirty tones. You know, that's what I want. Somewhere between ACDC and Metallica, mm. that's what I want. Just, just a rah, you know, you want, yeah, but that's that comes from figuring out what you want. You know, yeah. I'm not gonna get that with a PV solid state little, you know, twin ten. I'm gonna get that with a Marshall head. And a 412 and just crank the shit out of it. Yeah. Do you think there's something to be said for, um, it sounds a little hokey but, uh, and a little woo-woo, but I think, um, I think that there are certain, certain things within any kind of 
career that are imbued with history and and like almost like a symbolism of of those who've come before do you know what i mean ah, uh, yeah do, yeah do you know what i'm getting it's like fingerprints like through yeah yeah i totally yeah and it feels like there's a legitimacy to certain things yeah absolutely i feel, I feel like marshall has that I, and i think marshall has helped to define so many different generations of music yeah you know i mean the tone you get from a Marshall sound in Guns N' Roses is completely different from the tone you're going to get from Green Day, mm. you know? Or Paul Weller in the jam. It's exactly, like, yeah. exactly. It's, it's God, it, it just, it all comes down to the versatility. Yeah. That's why Marshall is at the top of the heap and always will be. Mm. I mean, I can remember in the late 80s, everybody wanted... Um, the fuck was it that like Metallica was using at the uh, Mesa Mesa Boogie? Everybody mm -hmm. wanted a Mesa Boogie because of Metallica, and then in the '90s it was like you know everybody wanted Orange because of this and that and the other. Everybody wanted Orange because of uh, Queens, mm -hmm. you know, or uh, Caius or whatever. So it's there's you know every once in a while these these other amps kind of you know kind of come and, and go like. Like for a while, everybody wanted Rivera because of Slipknot. You know, mm. I mean that's that was mix sound for the longest time. You know, yeah. but Marshall has always just been that mainstay. Yeah, it's that it's that that strong root that always never it, it never has to change. It will always be a touchstone to come back to. Yeah, um, as long as people are learning to play guitar and trying to figure out what they want to sound like, you know. Marshall, it just kind of goes, whatever, man, you know. Hmm. And and the thing I love is that Marshall's not stuck up about it. Marshall are very embracing. You know, they embraced me years ago, you know. I was a singer who played guitar. They didn't have to fucking get behind me. Yeah. And yet they knew that it's, you know, it's just as important for me to fucking really have that that grimy fucking dirty sound so I could write, you know, and they have always been good to me and I've never forgot that. So I, I try and go above and beyond for them. And that's unlike any other company really out there, unless it's like a boutique, you know, kind of smaller company. Marshall's got enough money. They don't have to do that. And yet they do it and they do it for their artists and they support their artists. And that kind of dedication is just unfucking heard of these days, you know. Yeah. And I think it's because it's the, still the family, you know. That family is still dedicated to the people who have helped them be where they're at. So they are dedicated to them as well. Perfect. Thanks. There you Mark. go. All good. The Marshall Podcast. Thank you to Corey for that. He can be found online at Corey Taylor Rock on Twitter or simply Corey Taylor on Instagram. Both his bands are on all the usual platforms and the album We Are Not Your Kind by Slipknot and Hydrograd by Stone Sour are out now. Right, so for part two, Lizzie Hale formed Hailstorm with her brother RJ in 97 and since that time she's released four albums with her band and also performed a bunch of guest spots with artists such as Shinedown, Blackstone Cherry, Machine Gun Kelly and Stone Sour. See, it all ties up. Um, and I caught up with Lizzie when she was last over in the UK and we spoke about her early influences, her first role models and how she now feels being one of the most recognisable front women in rock, which has made her in turn a role model to young women making music and forming bands for the first time. This is Lizzie Hale. Do -do. So, for this, I would rather they just be more of a conversation. Okay. Because when they first asked me to do it, I didn't want it to be about, so, what's your gain setting? Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I, exactly. And I get that there are people that really want to hear that kind of stuff, but I find it more interesting to find out about the artist I'm speaking to, like, why they play the music they play. That's cool. How they got to that point and how Marshall may have played a part in that. Absolutely. So, um, so if we could, I guess, start with things like... Um, do you remember like what the what the was there a specific album that you heard when you were a kid 
that, that suddenly made you view music in a different way rather than you know what it's like because yeah. you know when you reach a certain age and, and all of a sudden music changes from being something that you're surrounded by by your peer like either f- siblings or, and your parents yeah. and stuff and stuff you're just hearing on the radio to suddenly like you hear it in a different it be- way it, it becomes it, kind of now a part of you and um I grew up listening to a lot of my my dad's music, actually, and um, so from a very early age, you know, I remember um, probably around 11 uh, years old, uh, we had, you know, we we moved around a little bit within Pennsylvania, which is a big state anyway, but... um, you know, my dad introduced me to Alice Cooper and Deep Purple and Black Sabbath and that wow. kind of stuff. So I was listening to a lot of that stuff when I was young, um, which was interesting because, um, I, you know, I'm a, a young girl and that was not necessarily something that my peers were listening to at the time. Um, I specifically remember um, falling in love with um, Alice Cooper's Love It to Death and Ronnie James Dio's Holy Diver. Yeah. Um, those were, that was my jam. And it, for some reason it was just kind of, I don't know, I remember listening to it with my dad. My dad got me those two CDs and I would just, I burned them out. And I, I don't even know why, like there wasn't like a, a, oh, I connected with like the meaning or the lyrics or whatever. I just, it sounded so cool. And I, I remember being fascinated by, um, by watching these like kind of live videos too of yeah. those bands back in the 70s and 80s and just being enamored with how how do they talk to 60,000 people that's amazing yeah. um and this is before we started the band um i do remember re- realizing around that time when i was 11 that i was not cool um this is when we i realized that because we had just moved into a new place and uh these neighborhood girls asked me over for a sleepover and they said you know make sure you bring some of your favorite cds because we're all going to play our own favorite cds you can see where this is going (laughs) so this is around the time where there was um like tlc and backstreet boys and that kind of thing spice girls and and that was what was popular and i go over to this girl's house and we were having fun and everything and you know i that was like also the first time that somebody put makeup on me you know typical you know, girl sleepover, and oh, oh, we haven't played one of your CDs yet. You know, why don't you put it in? So I don't think, so we put in Alice Cooper's Love It to Death, and I don't think it made it past the first chorus. It was like the first chorus came in, and it's like, uh, uh, well, let's try the other one. Let's try the other one. And so we go into, you know, um, Holy Diver put it in, and same thing. It was just like, well, yeah. Um, why don't we put Tara's CD back on? You know, it just like was yeah. like, oh, you know, and I, I didn't understand. Um, How did you feel about that? Um, I didn't at the time. I, I was, I was a very shy kid. I, I was, I always call myself a reformed introvert, and it took being in this band and putting myself in those uncomfortable situations and in front of people to really come out of my shell and be a confident person. So I really yeah. didn't put up much of a fight about it, and I, I didn't, I didn't defend it at all. I'm just like, okay cool you know I guess we won't listen to my CDs but it's funny because then shortly after that about uh, when so when I was 13 we started the band and at the time I was still playing keyboards and then I my my dad ended up getting me a uh, Roland AX1 keytar so that was my gateway drug wow (laughs) into guitar yeah and um, we started the band and um, there was this uh, kid we knew that could play guitar. He came over. He was in the band for about six months. His mom took him out because he was doing, not doing well in school. And he, ended up, and he actually ended up lying to her and telling her that he quit the band, but that he kept doing shows with us. And then she found out, and it was a big deal. And, and myself, this was, um, sorry, this was fast forward. We started the band when I was 13. Um, I picked up the guitar when I, in between 15 and 16. So I was like 15. Yeah, I was about to turn 16 um, because I was distraught. I, I had just lost my first guitar player in our band. I'm like, we're never going to find another guitar player. But I, you know, but I, you know, I wanted to learn anyway. So now is a good time to learn. And so started, and literally the first thing that I played, and I, I ended up playing by ear for a long time because, you know, I was a keyboard player. So I would take like. That's E. Okay, that's E. And then a friend of mine showed me drop D, and that changed my world. Um, yeah. So when I was so early on, I was just kind of like barring everything. Yeah. But I uh, I ended up really I think the first thing that I learned was um, Heaven and Hell's 
Oh, well, Heaven and Hell by Black Sabbath. So, na, 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 na. Yeah. And my dad hooked up, um, he got me a distortion pedal, and I hooked up the guitar through the keyboard amp because I had, like, a Fender Rhodes at the time, and it came with those, yeah. you know, those custom, like, um, almost, like, plush amps or, like, they got, the, like, the padding on the outside. Yeah. And so it, it sounded terrible, you know, but, uh, but I just loved being loud finally I was loud and and I didn't know what I was doing but I was just kind of making noise and then when I made a noise that I liked I would just stick with that for a while you know um so really I mean that era of music you know and still very much as you can see I have the leather and the weird haircut it's still very much a part of who I am and yeah. um I just wanted to figure it out I wanted to figure out how how do these people do that and how you know, how do you stand up there with that with that axe and 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 just command the stage? And so, um, yeah, that was kind of the beginnings of it. It is interesting that loads of people I speak to in bands, especially really um, really exuberant and flamboyant people that play in bands, are some of the shyest people. And it's yeah. it's, it's such a at times, you know, it, it seems so at odds when I when I have friends that play in bands and you know that they're, they're in big bands and stuff, and then they're really private people and and quite, as you say, quite introverted. And it's almost like, how, how do you put yourself through that? Well, yeah, I think I think for me, the reason that I'm able to get on stage and and be a little larger than life, I think, is because I was like that because I had to fight for it. You know, even early days in Hailstorm, um, I would have to kind of put on this idea of myself and be somebody else because when I was myself on stage, I didn't want to look at anybody. I didn't want to look at anybody. And, um, and I started slowly but surely like, okay, I'm just going to like look at one person and just stare them down. So I must've been a very like creepy 15 year old at the time because this is around the time where I was like, I got to figure it out. I don't know how, but so I would, I would dress up. I always had, you know, stage clothes and the normal clothes and I would never wear the stage clothes outside. Now I can you know, do it. But at the time, that was a very important part of of becoming somebody else yeah, the and then ritual. just be yeah. like, all right. And, and it's so funny because when I would stare somebody down, you know, obviously it was a little awkward for some for some people and they would turn away and I'm like, ha, I got him. All right, next one. You know, <laughs> or just, so, work your way just work my way across the room. And it, it kind of gave me a little bit of a confidence booster. Um, <laughs> I forget who suggested that I do that. I feel like it was a friend or something just like, ah, oh, just look at one person. I'm like, hmm. okay, I'll start there. But yeah, I, but like I said, I think that I, I really had to fight to be my best self. And, and, um, it really, it was watching these people on stage and, and music and just the, the, it was so much more than, than a career choice or a hobby. You know, when, yeah, when I caught calling. the bug and we, we started playing out, you know, named the band Hailstorm when I was 13 and just have not stopped since. Um, but it was, you know, there's a fine line between determined determination and obsession. Yeah. And I always teetered that line because I, I took it very personally. It, it ended up being almost this extension of me, you know? And mm. so, you know, you want things to keep moving forward. And if they're not moving forward, does, does that mean that I, that I'm not moving forward as a person, you know? So it very much is still, um, is still my, my, you know, a, a huge part of my personality and, and this is my life, you know, and now that I'm an adult, I'm like, it's kind of like my child too, you know, it's all yeah. of those things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I, I always say this too. Um, you don't, you don't necessarily choose music because I remember the moment, you know, where I'm like, Oh, I, I think I could do this. I, I could totally do this, but there wasn't like a reasoning or a rational thought behind it. It was just, I, 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 I need to do this, I think, you yeah. know, like this is something that now I can't go a day without doing. So, and the goal has relatively stayed the same all these years, 20 years later, it's still, how do I make sure that I play music for the rest of my life? How, how do I make sure I play music or do something with music today? Yeah. You know? It's a trip, right? Yeah, it's really, it is. And now it's so funny because we just celebrated our 20th year of being a, of being hailstorm since that first show when I was 13 yeah. outside of our parents' living room, you know, and, um, and you know, you, you realize how far you've come and you've lived about six different lifetimes, you know, and then you still have those moments where it's like, Oh man, do I have to have confrontation right now? Damn it. I have to put that on. <laughs> yeah. When, so when you, I mean, you started really early for, for anyone really, I think, but do you find that, and I know this is probably that, something that you're, okay. you're a little bored with, because, but were there, 
many female role models that you really looked up to that made the, the desire to do these things attainable? Do you know what I mean? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you can, I can definitely cite our, or what, what I keep calling our foremothers of, of rock, as in the ones that came before, because, um, you know, like I said before, I was listening to a lot of my dad's music, and a lot of it was, you know, male vocals based yeah. and male front people. And, and then I think my mom at one point in time was like, well, you're really getting into your dad's music. I should, I should introduce you to some female rockers, you know? And so she kind of, I think it was one, it was a birthday or Christmas, got me like five CDs. So there was Heart, and it was actually a live record that she had found, uh, The Road Home was the first time I'd ever heard, heard Heart. And, uh, and then there was uh, Pat Benatar, Heat of the Night. Um, there was a, actually just a compilation of hits by Joan Jett, and then a Greatest Hits by Janis Joplin. Wow. And so she's like, listen to that. And that blew my mind. Um, and then um, as far as like female role models that I could actually talk to, because <laughs> at the time, like, I'm never going to meet these people. Yeah. And, um, and uh, there was a local band um, called Oslin. Um, and they had a female front. And they, they did primarily covers, but it was a lot of those songs. And she had a tremendous presence and a tremendous voice. Um, Andrea was her name, Andrea Oslin. And um, I actually, they ended up uh, letting us open up for them a, a bunch of times just as kids. You know, we didn't draw a crowd, but they were really nice to us. But sh she kind of took me under her wing as well. And, you know, because I would watch her and be just transfixed by the fact, because she had a very loud personality and, and a very a, a huge presence and you know, wore the leather on stage and had long black hair and wore red lipstick and and you know as I think at the time I was like 14 15 years old you know we just started and and um she would always talk to me about like oh you know this is this is what I do to get ready on stage and I drink a lot of water I didn't learn how to warm up yet or anything I didn't really know about the vocals but just watching that and being like wow that is so cool you know that that she can do that um that's possible now I know it's possible for somebody to do that and um you know always was very sweet to me which which I look back and 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 they they actually they ended up breaking up a couple years later and never really did anything with it and um, but the next time that I ended up I ended up bumping into her at some record shop and it's like oh you're still doing it and I'm like yeah yeah and that's this is awesome. a couple years ago and I'm like oh that's awesome and and obviously through Facebook just like this is so amazing that you're still doing that same thing that when I met you when I was when yeah. you were 15 and so that's really cool but yeah I, I mean I how, think how does it feel to be one of those people now. <laughs> Well, th that's what that's what's the trip, right? The, the, the craziness now is that I get um, little girls coming up to me and being like, I, I play guitar because of you. And I, I, I started a band. And, and um, actually, this was just two weeks ago. We did this uh, small acoustic set with, with kind of like question and answer, like a little conference thing, um, just kind of a special show. And this little girl, she's 11 years old, and she has a little brother. And she's like, I'm starting a band with my little brother because I heard you started it when you were 13 and he was 10. And I'm like, like, yeah. And she's like, well, how do I do that? You know, and I, I basically... My brother and I just basically told her, like, we'll do it. That's all we did was just, like, how do you play in front of people every day? And so anywhere that you can play, even if it's just in your living room, just play every day. And she was so, like, excited because – and, and it, it's, it's, it blows my mind because, you know, there were, there were a few – you know, like I said, there was very few, you know, when, when I was coming up in the scene. And, um, and I was so – um, lucky to have parents that supported me and never really put those limitations like, well, you're a girl, maybe this is going to happen. I was very naive to it all, thanks to my parents. And, and so just to be that for somebody and, and see like yeah. the, the, the fire in, in these kids' eyes and, and when they look up at you on stage when you're performing too and they're just like, whoa. Like I remember that feeling. Yeah. And so um, it's very humbling, you yeah. know, and, it, and very, I'm just honored to, to be that for some people now, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. You were saying earlier about when, when you first started playing guitar and, you know, getting a distortion pedal and plugging it into your keyboard amp. When did you realize that, that how did Marshall fit into that? Because for me, that uh, when I first started playing, I, w I really gravitated towards, like, um, certain companies like I started off as a bass player and I was obsessed with a bunch of different people so I was really I just wanted to play Warwick's yeah so and and then you know in the same way with different amps and stuff so were there people that that you looked up to that 
that were playing Marshall that made you want to use that, or was it a case of trial and error and go, actually, this is this is the best thing for what I want to achieve? Well, I mean, really, it started with the, you know my idols and these. I would over and over and over again. I would watch these videos of the bands that I loved, and and two things always came up: there were Gibson guitars and there were Marshall amps, and so it, yeah. t- it just kind of became this almost this uniform for rock and roll. And um, you know, in the same way that you know you you have you know crazy hair and a leather jacket. It's, it, was, it was very much that way. And it was, so it was, from the beginning, it was a goal of mine to get to that point where I could save up enough, <laughs> enough money and, also, and, and achieve both of those things, you know? And um, the, the used Gibson guitar came first and then shortly after, um, well, not shortly, this was after a couple of years of just beating around getting, you know, cheaper amps and everything to finally, you know, get a Marshall JCM 800, you know, because that was like the standard. Um, And it's interesting because when you finally get to that point where you have both of those things, the whole, it's, it's like, um, it's like the world opens up. It's like, okay, now I'm really doing it. You know, like it was a whole other level of, of encouragement for me. Like, okay, now I have these things and now I have to prove that I deserve them and that this is, part of myself and I don't know why but it it just it inspired me to be louder and to me for me to write better and everything because now you had that uniform um and it really wasn't even one specific person because like I, I saw you know there was you know the the Tom Kiefer's and then there was you know Zeppelin obviously and um you know all of those you know 80s bands and you know um that that would that would have that kind of combination or something of the like. So it was, it was both of those, and uh, and it's amazing. And I, I, you know, and I still do it today. And it's it's funny how I haven't really wavered from that combination yeah. um, because I feel like you know, and I've experimented, and especially like in the studio, you know, you use different amps and you yeah. use different guitars and everything. But I always come back to that because it's just not quite right. It does not. It doesn't have that same feeling that you used to get when you used to listen to those songs and listen to those bands and and uh that same thing that 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 made you fall in love with the with the music so it's it's almost like a jinx like i don't want to change it because it's working so far (laughs) you know awesome thank you you're welcome thank you so much thanks for for listening to me ramble (laughs) it's no small feat (laughs) the marshall podcast Thank you to Lizzie. The latest Hailstorm album, Vicious, is out now, and you can find them online at hailstormrocks.com. Make sure you go over to marshall.com for all things excellent, and look out for news for the next episode, which is with Brian Paul, legendary singer of the Tremolos, and personal friend to Jim Marshall since the beginning. It is a really good one. Find me on my socials, which are at Daniel P. Carter, And the last thing to say is thanks for listening. I'm out. Peace.